been this morning in Ephesians chapter 6. We didn't get through far last week, but we got through one. <laughs> we'll get through a few more today. We're talking about the armor of God, talking about spiritual warfare and how we're to prepare for it because it will be coming our way, uh, whether we want it to or not. It's going to come your way sometime along in this life, maybe more than once or twice. It could come your way that uh, the devil would try to throw a, a, a hitch in your get-along or whatever you want to call it and try to stumble you and make you fall and, uh, or turn your back on God completely. He hasn't changed his MO. He still uses the same stuff he did in the garden. He tries to get us to doubt God's word. He tries to get us to not trust God and to trust in ourselves. And his, his work is still going on the same today as it was even back then. But it's good for us to know our enemy. It's good to know how he operates and how he comes at us. Because he will blindside you once in a while. But it, to know how he operates, to know him, we can eventually uh, overcome him, right? And, and win a couple of battles here and there. Trust me, the war has already been won. Amen, church? Jesus took care of the war. But the skirmishes are still going on after the battles have been done. So we need to understand that we're in that battle and we need to be ready for that. Now last week I talked about there in Ephesians chapter uh, 4, I'm sorry, ch chapter 6, starting in verse 14. I'll read again these verses here. It says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth bu buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray, in all spirit, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. And I'll stop right there. The first part it shows is the belt of truth. I mentioned last week, if you don't have the truth right, the rest of this is not going to work at all. And I, there was a few points on the truth. I'll go back and recap it just a little bit. The first of all, the belt of truth. Point number one is Christ is the truth. Amen? He is the truth. Not just the Son of God, not just a great prophet. He is truth. His, he is truth, and not is he truth. But the second part of the of belt of truth is the Word of God is truth. This book right here, amen, no other book. This book right here, the Holy Bible, is true from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Everything in it is true. It's absolute because in a day that we don't claim absolute truth, everybody has a relative truth. Whatever your truth is yours and mine is mine. No, it's not like that. It's God's truth, and everything that goes against it is not godly, bottom line. And we need to understand, even in the church, everything that goes against his truth is ungodly. Can church be ungodly? Absolutely. Be careful. Amen. Be careful. Because we can be against God if we're not careful. So the word of God is the truth. Third thing I talked about was speaking and living a life of truthfulness is truth. Truth comes from us outside these walls. Yeah, inside the walls too. But out there where the world sees it, us living a righteous life, a truthful life, is shown to them. It's shown to them, and trust me, they see it. They may not say anything about it. And then once in a while, somebody may come and go, explain to me why you're so... You're so uh, into this God thing. Why, why are you so, there's something different about you. Why are you so into, how are you so sure what's going to happen to you after death? And even the Word of God, Paul tells us, says, be ready to give an account. Amen. Be ready to give an answer for those questions that come your way. Because they will come. The lost world will see you and you're an anomaly in this world because we're strangers in this world, aren't we? We're actually the aliens in this world. We don't belong to this world anymore. We belong to Jesus and, and God's world, Right? And we're just strangers walking in this world. So in reality, us who have been born again are now seated with Christ. So you're, you're a stranger here. And the world's going to look at you and go, there's something different about you. Has anybody ever approached you with that question? What is it about you that, you know, you don't, you don't party with the rest of us? You don't do this? You don't do and they think you're kind of a fuddy-dud at first. And then they realize there's something different about that. It's not just a fuddy-dud. It's not just being square. It's being righteous out there in the midst of unrighteousness. Okay, and they'll see that in our life. So we need to understand that third part of that is speaking and living a life of truthfulness brings about truth. And it depends upon a, a number. One last thing that it depended upon is that it supports us. The belt of truth supports us in the battle. It supports us in the battle. It gives us strength. God's word, knowing his word, when the times of trial and tribulation may come your way, knowing his word gives you strength to stand, doesn't it? You see, it's all in this word. It's all in knowing this word to give you the strength that it says to stand firm, hold your ground, 
Don't tuck and run. Stand firm. On what? The Word of God. Truth, right? You stand on it. How are you going to stand on something you don't know? Which is the second part of this. You need to know that Word. Amen? We need to dig in, folks. We need to know. We don't just need to graze over it and kind of graze here and there and yonder. And It's kind of like that video that was shown in Sunday school that says, Oh, yeah, I have a Bible. I got God's Word. very Word in my hands. I read it when I can, when I'm not too busy doing this or that or the other. That's God's Word, man. If you're going to stand against the wilds of the devil and the fiery darts of the devil, you better know some of that Word. Amen? You better know who you are. And that Word will tell you exactly who you are and exactly why you have the ability to stand firm and not tuck and run because the, wild, the devil's going to come with these things. It's interesting here that, 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 that strength supports us in the battle and the trials of life. Jesus Christ himself, Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, tells us who Jesus was. Basically what he was all about. As a matter of fact, let me read it to you. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Y'all understand that, right? He was fully human. Amen. He was fully human, tested. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. He didn't fall for it. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Basically what Hebrews is talking about there is Jesus was just like us in the flesh. He, he went, underwent every one of those temptations. You see it in Matthew where he's talking about the temptation of Christ out in the desert. Forty days and forty nights. What was the first thing Satan tempted him with? His belly. Food, right? <laughs> we can all go there, right? Hungry. You get hangry when you get there. If y'all have ever gone 40 days without eating a bite, you're really hangry by that point, right? You really are. So what's the first thing he comes and tempts Jesus with? Food. He said, turn these stones into bread. Surely your daddy won't let you starve to death, right? Makes sense, doesn't it? He kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Surely your dad's not going to make you starve to death. No, he won't. And Jesus answered him out of Deuteronomy. He says, man shall live by every word of the mouth of God. Not by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus answered him the same way we do. You better know scripture in order to answer him in that way when he comes. The next thing we see here, he says, take on the belt of truth. The breastplate of righteousness. Now, as, as Paul is looking at this Roman soldier, he sees a metal, uh, iron, or they made them out of different things. Some of them had wood and leather on them, but... Uh, a breastplate covering all the way down to his waist and every vital organ was covered for battle. Every vital organ was covered. A sword could not make it through that. It's going to ricochet off that bre breastplate, right? It cannot penetrate that breastplate. It is made to stop, as it says here in the scripture, the breastplate of righteousness in place. The breastplate of righteousness. That breastplate is covering our, our, from our neck down to our, our thighs, if you will, like protecting the heart. A sign of a Christian soldier is righteousness. When we're saved, now understand this, God imputes the righteousness of Jesus Christ on us. Imputes means he puts it on us. Our righteousness, as Isaiah says, is what? Filthy, isn't it? It's, it's nasty, it's dirty. Our self-right, our produced righteousness is filthy in God's sight. Jesus had to die. God had to take his righteousness and impute it upon, put it upon us to make us what? Acceptable to God it's not our righteousness folk it's Jesus righteousness put on or imputed upon us by God so that we can do what live whatever way we want to no indeed Paul warned against that didn't he the grace of God doesn't give us license to go out there and live like whatever we want to and then come back in here and act real holy right that's not what it's about the grace of God, the righteousness of Jesus imputed upon us is so that we can approach the throne room with boldness and confidence and with mercy. Think about that. Every time you pray, every time you approach in the throne room of God. You see, we don't understand approaching a king. We don't understand approaching authority like that. If we lived in a country that was king ruled, you just wouldn't go bang on the king's door and say, Hey, king, yo, I need a time with you. Uh, they take your head, slam off, right? You don't approach a king like that. You approach a king through someone else and you come in there and you bow down to that king and then you bring your petition if the king ever lets you even in the throne room, right? But in this situation, when God imputed Christ's righteousness upon us, we little human beings, right? He opened that door and said, you can come into the king anytime you want to because you got my righteousness on you and you are acceptable only because of his righteousness given to you. You see, we can't wrap our head around that. 
God's grace is all over us. His mercy is all over us, but also Christ's righteousness is all over us. You may say, well, brother, I don't feel very righteous. It's not about feeling. It's a fact. It's a fact. God said it whether you feel it or not is true. Amen? <laughs> That's another saying. I'm going to write that down. God said it whether you believe it or not is true. God said it whether you feel it or not, it's still true. Jesus' righteousness is imputed upon you, Christian, upon you, believer. That is one of the things we are baptized with, if you will, in God. When we come to God and say, I surrender all, I want Jesus as my Savior. I want you to save me from my sin. I need Jesus as my Savior. Forgive me and you name off your... Impute it upon you. Amen. From that moment on, it's not a second or a third blessing. It's put on you immediately when you repent and come to God. So our breastplate of righteousness is imputed upon it, given to us through Jesus Christ himself. We're to live in that righteousness of Jesus Christ as we are walking this earth. Amen. You're to be walking in that righteousness as you walk this earth. What will keep you from it? Sin. What will keep you from it? Uh, overindulgence of whatever you want to do. It, running away from God. Disobeying God. That'll keep you from walking in Jesus' righteousness. Even though it's already imputed upon you to approach God. It's also imputed upon you to show the world out there, in Walmart, in wherever you are, to show the world that you are a new creation. You're changed. You're not like the rest of the world. Don't blend in. <laughs> You're not like the rest of the world. It ain't going to happen. You can't do it. If you do, something's wrong. If we blend in too well, something is wrong, bad wrong. His righteousness does not give us a license. Paul warned us against, as I said before, not to sin or to go on and sin and do what we want to. No, 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 no. As a matter of fact, it said in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So where is your righteousness? In him. Amen? In Jesus. Where is it implanted? In you. <laughs> it's a, it's a, I got it from him. It's in me. I give it back to the rest of the world. I give it away, right? I live in it. I, I walk in it daily. I don't walk in it just on Sunday morning at 1030. I walk in it every day, 24-7. Even to that job I go to, right? Even around them heathen I, I associate with at the ball game, whatever. I walk in that righteousness all the time. And that righteousness is shown and people will see it. What does it look like? What does it look like? Titus 2, 11 and 12 says this. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Not in the age to come. Won't be hard then. You have no sin to deal with, right? In this present age, it teaches us, it gives us the power to say no to ungodliness. Think about that, folks. You've got more power within you by the Holy Spirit than you're actually tapping into. <laughs> Think about it. The power to say, nope, I choose not to. I am not going to do that in the name of Jesus. I'm walking away from it. I'm not falling for that again. Again, because we all fall for the same thing over and over. And it seems like it keeps coming with the same jump, right? Not doing it again. Standing firm. Feet planted. Word of God planted in my heart breastplate of righteousness ready to go and then it goes on talks about he said okay your breastplate of righteousness is in place and your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace the sandals of the gospel now paul's probably looking at this soldier going those were some nice sandals nike didn't have them out back then obviously but they were good right really good sandals you look at a roman soldier's sandal it's got kind of straps that come up on the calf to hold it good and steady guess what else it had in that day and time the roman soldier would also put spikes in his sandal, nails to grab the ground with, driven through his sandals to hold the ground. Back in the day when I played football uh, in the 70s, we used to wear cleats that had, they were hard plastic, but they had a metal tip on them. You could hear the football, coming, the football team coming from a mile away if we walked across concrete. It was that <laughs> sound going on. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, those cleats could cut you. I had cuts all over my hands from those things. They were, they were not sharp. They were rounded, but they were still cleats. They would grab we all played in dirt back in that day, and they would grab that dirt, and the longer the cleat, if it's rainy and muddy, you put a longer cleat on. You, you dress yourself for the conditions. And that cleat would, if we'd have gone out there in today's tennis shoes and tried to play on that grass and mud, couldn't hardly even stand up. But the cleat gave us traction. 
the cleats on the bottom of those football shoes gave us the ability to hold our ground or push forward. It did. It gave us all that. So when I see this in this situation where he says, the sandals of the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ gives us traction. It gives us that grip that we need to hold our ground. Remember what he's talking about. He's not talking about going into warfare. He's saying, hold your ground. Hold your ground. Make a stance. Get ready to get hit, but hold your ground. You got your cleats in the ground, in other words. So he's looking at these sandals of this Roman soldier. He's seeing those nails. And he's thinking, oh, yeah, that soldier is ready to get a grip and hold his ground and get his stance and put those cleats in the ground. You're not going to move him. You're not going to push him backwards. And that's the whole point of what Paul is saying here when he says stand firm. He's saying put on this armor, understand this armor is on you and stand firm. You have on your feet, spiritually speaking, cleats, if you will, to hold your ground. What is it? This is the shoe? No, it's the Word of God. It's part of the whole outfit. It's part of the whole ensemble. The Word of God, the belt of truth, right? Bright, breastplate of, right, uh, of righteousness to keep our vital organs, our, our vital parts protected by God himself, by the word of God. Now you've got these shoes on that you don't turn and run, but you are actually standing your ground. That's what this whole thing is all about. When you've done this, stand firm, stand firm. Verse 14, the first two words, stand firm then, doesn't it? He didn't say attack. He didn't say run at it. You don't chase after Satan with a water pistol and say I'm running him into the gates of hell. No, you stand your ground, but there's no attack going on here. It's all about just standing firm, standing firm. So we see the sandals of the gospel. He, he had his nails in his, his grips of his, sh his sandals. He was ready to fight at any moment, standing firm. And Lehman Strauss said, as quoted b before, saying this, he said, the soldier's shoes, can't say that real fast, are not the dancing slippers of this world or the lounging slippers of the slothful, but the shoes of a Christian warrior who knows Christ and makes him known who knows Christ and makes him known. When that question comes or whenever you're standing firm, you're ready. You're ready to answer for your faith. You're ready to answer against the lie. You're ready to stand firm against the lie, right? You're ready to stand firm against the darkness that may be coming. You stand firm. You stand firm in this whole situation. And in Acts 1.8, it says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth, because that's that feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. It's all about the gospel. It's all about the witness of what we're standing firm for. We're not standing firm to say, hey, look at me, look at me. You know, we're standing firm because we say, look at God. He is my foundation. He is my strength. He is my everything, right? And the world will see that when we stand against darkness in that way. Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. It's the power of God. What? The gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not to be ashamed. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of it. It's the power of salvation. It is salvation. Everything about salvation is Jesus Christ. Everything about what he did is in Jesus Christ. Everything about what we receive from it and what we're going to receive from it is because of Jesus Christ. We need to get a grip on that and understand salvation is in no other name. Amen? Except the name of who? Jesus, right? No other name is that salvation in. We need to proclaim that. Proclaim it. 1 Peter 3.15, I just mentioned this a moment ago. In your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have or the surety that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. 1 Peter 3.15. Always be ready to give an answer. Has anybody ever questioned you about that before? Get ready. Get ready. Because I've already warned you. Have your answer ready to go, right? You know now, right? Have your answer ready to go. Be ready and prepared to answer any question that comes your way about your faith and about who you follow. Next thing we see, we got the feet fitted with the gospel. We got the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The shield of faith in God. Faith is your shield. Now, as he's looking at this Roman soldier, there was two shields they would carry. Most of the time, you would see them with a little round shield. It's only about two and a half feet and would be able to block the blows of the, of the enemy, the arrow or the, the other swords coming at them and fight with that shield. You've probably seen that in movies and all the little short, short shield, I call it. I can't say that either. Uh, but the shield that he's talking about is what you see uh, in some of the movies where it's almost four or five feet tall. 
And it's got a little cut out in the edge where they can put the spear through it. And, and they put this shield down in front of them. You can't get through that thing. And they can poke at you. They can hit you coming with that shield in front of them. And they're totally, they're totally covered with that shield. I've seen some movies before talking about the, the ancient Greeks and all. And how they fought. And the, and the Trojans and all that. How they fought with those shields. And they would literally, if you had a, a, a group of a hundred, the first row would get up and go shield to shield and make a barrier. You couldn't go through that thing. You could not push through that shield. You get about 50 guys lined up in a line across there with the shields down like that and the group right behind them with the shields up like None of your arrows are going through there. None of your spears are going through there. As a matter of fact, they could take that shield, raise up a little bit, and start walking toward you, toward the enemy, and push them back. Push them completely back because that shield protected them in all areas. So in this situation here, we need to know that our shield of faith in God is also like that long shield. It's a protection from the fiery darts of Satan. Now, does Satan have new fiery darts? Same ones, but they're effective. They're effective if you don't have your shield of faith up. They're effective in that they will destroy you and, and if you don't have something to protect yourself with. Faith in that God is in control. We're in an age right now well, we got to believe, if you don't believe God is sovereign and in control, you'd go nuts watching the news. Amen? If you didn't believe he's sovereign and in control of this, you'd think, oh, Satan's having a heyday. No, he's having what God allows him to have. He's on a chain, remember? <laughs> he's like a roaring lion looking for who he can devour, but unless he gets permission, he can't devour. Understand that. He cannot devour. God's in control. Always will be, always has been. Some of the darts of Satan. We, we realize that, that, that uh, he, he throws these things at believers. He, he doesn't have to throw them at the lost world. He's already got them. Why throw a dart at somebody you already have? What's the first thing I have seen time and time again that Satan throws a dart at? Whether a Christian's really saved or not. Gets you to start doubting, doesn't he? He gets you to start doubting. Have you really given your life, you know? If you really give in your life, you wouldn't be doing this sin over here. He's always going to throw you under the bus, right? If you understand that, that we're still going to wrestle with sin. We are not perfected yet, church. Amen? Amen? <laughs> we're not perfected yet. We're attaining. We're heading that direction. We're moving that direction. Until God glorifies and completes salvation in us, you will continue to struggle with sin to the day you die from this planet. Amen? You will. Being a Christian doesn't mean it's all fixed. What it means is now you're on a different team and you have the power not to. It doesn't fix anything, does it? It fixes your eternal life, your salvation. Yeah, but it does not fix the problem. The problem with this world is just fallen. It's got sin issues. It's all around us. I cannot even imagine what it's going to be like to live in a world that has no sin effect to it. Can you? No, because we've been raised up in it. We don't know anything different than that. Trust me, those that's gone before us, though, they know what it's like. And they know what's coming in that millennial reign. They know what's about to happen upon, even upon this earth. They know what's about to happen. The sin's going to be pushed away and, and the devil himself locked away for a season, for a millennial, if you will. We don't know how to operate in that world because we understand the world of being fallen, the world of being... Uh, 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 our minds being attacked and, and, and uh, made fun of or whatever. We understand that world. So Satan, one of his darts, and the darts, you understand something about the dart. We, not that little thing you throw at the dart board on the wall. The darts in the first century here in this warfare were kind of like a spear, a short spear or an arrow that they dipped in a pitch in an oil type thing and they'd light it on fire and then they'd fling it at you. And we're talking about warfare that's up close. Today we do warfare from miles away from each other. We don't even see each other when we're blowing each other apart. But in that day and time, they'd be from me to you, to you, just that close, throwing stuff at each other, right? Throwing a dart at each other. That dart had that, in, uh, that oil pitch and stuff on it when it was lit, and it would throw it at you. If it hit your shield and if it hit you, it would kind of explode and catch you on fire and everybody around you that it would hit. So the shield, as it's talking about here, would catch those fiery darts. And them shields were not just something that would burn. Some of them were metal, some of them had leather on front of them, and they'd dip them in water before the battle and make sure it was good and wet so it would quench the what? Fiery darts, wouldn't it? Paul sees this and he says, oh, that's exactly what God does for us in the spirit world. He quenches the fiery darts of Satan as he flings them at us 
hoping he'll gain into us, but we have our what? Shield of faith up, don't we? And when it hits the shield and not the heart, we keep on marching as if nothing ever happened, right? If we were to be able to see our shield, we go, whoo, look at all the darts in that thing, man. He liked to got me with that one, right? He almost got me with that one. Why didn't he? Because you had your shield of faith up. You were walking in faith. And you had that shield up. You were protected. Some of the other things, question our call. Question if you're worthy. You ever questioned that before? I'm just not worth the salvation of Jesus. Yeah, you were. If he wasn't, he wouldn't have died for you. Think about that. Some of you may have problems with self-esteem. Think about that. If you weren't worthy of it, Jesus should have not died, right? But you were. In his eyes, you're worthy. Maybe not in your own. Maybe not in your daddy's. Whoever talked you down off of that one. You are worthy because he did it for you. Individually, corporately, worthy of his death. We're worthy because he chose it to be that way. Years ago, long before we ever came, right? He chose to come down and pay for the sin of the world, the sin of man, to bring salvation. He thought we were worthy, whether you believe it or not. If he makes this question, another dart he throws, can we really serve? Question, doubt, wonder. What's God really like? What's over there? I'm scared of death. Does he ever make you scared of death? You ever get those things in your head? I'm scared of that network. That's just a, I just read something this week about that, and it was, it was just like, it was so plain and clear the way he did it. He said, you ever know those turnstiles that you see as you go into a big bill, a bank or something, it's just constantly turning like this, <laughs> right? And they explain death this way. You're on this side of it, and suddenly you go through it, and you're on that side of it. But you're still conscious, you're still, away, you're still you, right? And I was like... <laughs> That's so simple. It sounds so real that you're on this side of it and we just step through the turnstile and we step into eternity, right? We step into that eternity. And, and, I, and, and when I think about that, I think, you know, it makes you think death's nothing to really fear. It's nothing to really fear because it is the gateway for our eternal blessing. You think about that. you got to go through the gate. Trust me, everybody here, including myself, if Jesus delays his coming for another 200 years, 150, whatever, right? If he delays that, every one of us is going to die in this room. If you live that long, God bless you, but, you know, I don't want to, right? Uh, every one of us is going to be gone. We're going to step through that portal. We're going to step through that gate. We're going to go through that turnstile into everlasting life and be just as conscious as we are now and just as real as we are now. Our bodies will be laid in the ground, waiting for that resurrection day when Jesus comes and says, Come up and let's gather them all together, be put back in them bodies again. I've already said before, I want my 20-year-old body. I don't, I don't think we get any choice. But anyway, point being, it's going to be glorified, isn't it? It's going to be fit for heaven. It's going to be ready. We've already studied Thessalonians. We know what happens when those in the grave ride first and then the, those of us who are left, if it happens today, amen, graves open first and then those that are left, well, us, le I can't say it, us that are left will be raised up and meet him in the air. We will be immediately glorified from flesh to a glorified body, but still the body. Amen. We're not, as I was reading this book, I was studying about this thing, I said, I, you tend to sometimes think we're just going to float around in heaven as a spirit. No, no I don't think so. <laughs> we're going to float around like this. No, we're not going to float. We're going we're to move just like we're moving now. So it's going to be a different dimension. It's going to be a different thing altogether because no sin, no decay, no death, no dying, no pain, no sick. Right? You get the message? It's going to be so much different, but yet so much the same. So much the same. That we will recognize. We will move. Have you had the dart of Satan thrown at you to be discouraged, depressed, defeated? Of course we have. Did you have your face shield up or did you get hit? Down, oh, right? I got hit a few times. I don't know about y'all. I'm not going to wear my halo very high today. I got hit a number of times. I didn't have my shield up. I didn't have my stuff on. I, didn't have, I wasn't ready, right? I wasn't ready. What about burning with passion and desire? Yeah. Ouch. Shield was down, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because he knows when, he's, when to bring it to you. And often he takes that dart and he, head, he shoots for your head. 
He wants control of this gray matter between your ears. Because if he can control that, he can pull your heart any way he wants to. Can he? Now think about it. Think about it. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. Right? He can control that mind. He gets control of your mind. He tax that mind, gets you thinking in this way. You start being defeated. You start moving whatever way he wants you to move. I'm talking about Christian. I'm not talking about lost people. I'm talking about us. We start moving and being used any way he wants us to be used until we stop, stand firm, and say, no more. I take back that thought. I take back every thought that brings about that kind of condemnation. I take back all that, and I do not, because Paul says, capture every thought that's not godly. Capture that, in other words, take it back. Don't let him take it and use it against you. He says to take back that which is offen offensive in God. And he says he goes after the mind. He says that, that the Christian show, soldier is, has his shield of faith, a complete trust in God that God will quench every fiery dart. That whole thing about faith is, again, about the sovereignty of God. You get the sovereignty of God down, your faith is strong, I guarantee you, because you'll know then it's all about him. It's all dependent upon him. No matter what happens, my faith is still in him. Amen? This country falls tomorrow, goes into communist hands, guess which God I'm going to worship? Him. Amen. Amen. Guess which God I'm going to praise? Him. Guess which God I'll take a bullet for? Him, if I have to. If they come and they say, you profess Jesus Christ, we're going to shoot you right now? Have at it, baby. You're promising me eternal life with God. Go for it. Right? Do you have that kind of brassness? Do you have that kind of a stance to say, I will not turn my back on my Savior? Look, folks, I know I'm reaching out there a little bit, but we could be very close to that happening in this free country right now. We could be close to that. We don't know how close that is. Will God make us go through something like that? I don't know. A little persecution never hurt anybody, did it? Nope. It hurts us Americans, though, doesn't it? Yeah, right. I didn't mean to get off on that. Anyway, but anyway, understand that shield of faith keeps us safe. One last, couple last verses here. Psalm 33, 20 says, We wait and hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Psalm 84, 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing uh, does he withhold from those who walk, whose walk is blameless. Did y'all get that last one? No good thing he withholds from those whose walk is blameless. Get the whole verse in there, though. <laughs> whose walk is blameless. Is your walk blameless? Are you walking in that right? Walking what he's given you to walk in? Then God didn't withhold anything. No good thing from us. From those who will walk blameless. And walk in that, that power that he has. I'll have to let you guys go. We're getting, get, getting through it, but not yet. Amen. We've got a few more things to go through. But I want to encourage you folks. I don't want to get you down on this thing. I want to encourage you. Your number one thing to understand is this book right here. Not your psychology book. Not your self-help books. All this kind of, But this book right here. Amen. Call it the Bible. Holy Bible. Understand that. That's your war. That's your warfare. That's your weapon. That's exactly what puts all this on us. The breastplate of righteousness. The shoes. The sandals with the gospel of peace. The shield of faith. We're getting in later on to the sword, right? The helmet and the sword. We're going to get into that later on. But, but all this is applied by knowing this book. Knowing the scripture. And applying that scripture in our life. And I'm not saying, I'm not talking about through all this just to get you scared. I'm, I'm talking to you through this to get you bold, to get you to understand, hey, I can stand. Because it's not me standing, it's Christ in me. It's his righteousness in me causing me to stand firm against the lie. Bring light in the midst of darkness that's onslaughting, right? I think Connie said something this morning about the absence of light gives darkness the freeway or something like that, is it? Absence of light. Be light. Amen? Be light. Don't be brash and all that kind of stuff about it, but just go out there and be light in the midst of darkness. Go out there and live righteousness in the midst of ungodliness. And just live righteous. Speak the word of truth. And let them have to deal with that truth. Amen? We have to, every time we read this book, we have to deal with truth. And you and I have to struggle with it all the time. Our life may not be lined up with what the truth of this word says, and that's on us. That's where we come to repent. That's where we come to light in those situations, come to truth. And when we know it, we do it. 
We don't skirt around it. We do it. We do what it tells us to do. I encourage you with that. You're stronger than you think you are because you have the power of God within you. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Stand on that. Stand on that this week. Let's pray. I'll let you guys go.